As I was reflecting uh, this week and thinking about and preparing for this message, I was reflecting on the variety of weather that we have had this year. Now it is Montana. We always have a variety of weather, but I was kind of thinking back of the really cold months at the beginning of the year. Anybody remember that? And then lots and lots of moisture, record rainfall in certain parts of Montana leading to flooding, and that's been maybe the last two years we've had that. And then thunderstorms. This summer, more thunderstorms in a row than I can remember. I mean, it's one thing to have a thunderstorm and be like, oh, we had a thunderstorm, you know. Um, People from other parts of the country are like, yeah, that's like every day for us. But multiple thunderstorms in a row. And it reminded me how much I I love variety. I love changes in weather. It was also, though, a sobering reminder of the damage weather can do. Um, Obviously, with forest fires and thunderstorms being the number one cause of those fires, people losing their homes because of flooding. And that is just the material damage. That does not include our emotional experience through those times. Well, this morning, we're continuing in our series in the book of Psalms throughout the summer, and we are going to look at a psalm, Psalm 93, where we find multiple references to the floods. The floods, and, and in the context of this psalm, it's not literal floods that David is talking about, but these experiences of life where we can feel like the water's rising. Anybody feel that way? You're, you're losing control, you're losing your footing, you don't know what's going to happen, and all of the emotional stuff that comes with being in the middle of a flood. When I was in high school, I went fishing with my dad in a river that's controlled by a dam, And I always like to just get out in the water. I was standing in the water. So I was out almost to the middle of the river fly fishing when all of a sudden the water started to rise. And I started to see rapids above me where there were no rapids. Now, it turns out the dam was being opened. I don't know how we didn't get that memo, but I I went from, from this peaceful, beautiful, serene day fly fishing to really terrified water barreling down on me and really scared. And eventually the water did take my feet out, but I swam to the bank and got out. My dad was over there on the edge and pulled me in. But how many of you ever felt that way, right? In in your life, things are good. You've got a plan. You've got your bills paid. Your relationships are going well. And then, man, just in a moment, how quickly can it feel like I'm going under? I, I have no control over what's happening right now. Well, this is what we see in Psalm 93. David addresses these floods we experience, but most importantly, how do we respond in the middle of the flood and be reminded of the fact that God is mightier than the flood? So we're going to read Psalm 93. It's a short psalm, but let me pray for us. God, we are here today to hear from you, and I pray that you give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to respond and that your truth today would not just be something theoretical or hypothetical, but that it would touch the very real places of each life here, each life and person watching online. And especially in those areas, God, where we feel overwhelmed, where we don't know what's coming, we we do feel out of control, God, that you'd bring real transformational presence and power into those places. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 93, verse 1. Here's where David uh, begins his song. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thundering of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits or is fitting for your house, O Lord, forevermore. So as I said, that's it. It's a very short song, but very similar to last week's song, uh, Psalm 62, we see this spectrum of experience packed into this short little psalm. The, the, the feeling of confidence and control 
And then suddenly there's this sense of chaos and panic. And you see it all here. We talked last week about how this is not some one-time rare event, but kind of the experience of our humanity, whether you're a Christian or not. These, these cycles that we go through where we know, in, in the case of believers, God is in control. He reigns. He's on his throne. But how many times does our experience overwhelm and overshadow that knowledge? I forget that God is in control. So David begins with a statement of confidence, the Lord reigns. And in our politicized culture, I think a contrast to this would be the Lord is trying to get into office. <laughs> the Lord is actively campaigning. He's trying to get followers. He's hoping for enough votes. No, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty, David continues. He's put on strength as his belt. Picture a ruler, and in these times specifically, you would know a ruler from a distance because of the way they were dressed. You'd see the robe, you'd see the crown, you'd see, and you'd say, that's the king. And David is saying, just like we recognize the clothing of a ruler, we recognize God, not by his clothing, but by his character. You, you, you see the fact that he is majestic. There is no one more dignified, no one more impressive than God. He has put strength on as his belt. Anyone who's looking for strength, that is one of God's defining characteristics, the one who gives strength to the weary. And so David goes on not only talking about who God is, but what he does. He expands our perspective. The world is established it shall never be moved. You look around and it makes sense that a God who is majestic and powerful, that, that, that his character will be manifested in his creative work. You see this in one of my favorite verses, Psalm 119, 68, David says to God, you are good and you do good. Isn't that cool? His character informs his creation. His creation reflects his character. The heavens Declare the glory of God. And so David is establishing how unshakable God is. Verse 2, your throne is established from of old. You're from everlasting. You're not wondering whether or not this is going to turn out well. <laughs> so we're getting this picture of confidence. But then verse 3, a very dramatic, abrupt change in tone. The floods have lifted up. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. You notice the repetition? The floods, the floods, the floods. What are situations in life where repetition might be fitting? Um, I was my first, you know, we have six kids, my wife and I, and um, getting our kids to clean their room uh, is a situation where I find myself repeating myself. And maybe each time I repeat myself, there's a little more, little more emotion, a little more energy in that. Um, on the positive side, I think about going to a Grizz game. How many times does the crowd repeat stuff? Montana. Okay, yeah. And you do that a billion times. And the idea is you're focused on a particular thing with rising intensity of emotion. But then you think about that reality on the negative end of the spectrum. And when I read this verse, I picture panic. Panic. The floods, the floods, the floods. It's like you're sliding toward the edge of a cliff and you go, no, 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 right? There's repetition built into that experience. And I, I'd be surprised if David had some sort of underlying meaning in the repetition of three. But I couldn't help this week but go on a journey and I studied all of the biblical references to the experience of flood, not just literal flood, but, but kind of our human experience of flood. And I found three categories of floods that we all face. So I wanted to take some time this morning to look at some of these examples. And then after, as I said, talk about how we respond in the floods. The first category, um, which I found to be the most abundant in Scripture, is the flood of relational conflict. Anyone ever feel that? Maybe it's different perspectives on something, maybe you're feeling misunderstood and that manifests in sort of withdrawal or passive aggressiveness. Maybe you have felt physically threatened, literally in danger in a relationship. So many different ways, but David speaks regularly 
of this as a flood. And in Psalm 69, he, he basically addresses all three. Uh, he says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. And you're wondering, gosh, what is he going through? He tells us in verse 4, more in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. And so you feel this sense of helplessness and overwhelm and, and we may read these passages of David and say, well, I've, I've never had so many people opposing me that, you know, it's more than the, the number of hairs on my head. I have. Um, <laughs> but most of you cannot say that. But, but you know what? I, I'm sure you've experienced this. I know I have. It only takes one. It only takes one to feel like a flood, especially if that one is someone who is a friend, someone who you've trusted. And David speaks to that experience in Psalm 88, another place. There's actually quite a few in the Psalms. David says, my soul is full of troubles. Verse 8, my friends have rejected me. Verse 17, they surround me like a flood all day long. We all relate to this. The next area of of flooding I found and, and just kept seeing as a repeated theme is what I would call, we would call personal sin. You know, it's easy to point at others, the world, the culture, whatever is the source of all of our problems. And we can easily fall into this victim mindset, but I have found and would suggest that a far more powerful and persistent and present flood is the reality of my own sin. David in Psalm 32 proclaims the blessing for those who have been forgiven of all their sins. It begins, blessed is the one who's forgiven. How wonderful. But then in verse 3, he, he recounts and he remembers the time before he had experienced that forgiveness. And he says this, when I was silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Remember we talked about that last week. Stop and think about what that feels like, how terrible that is to be holding on to your sin. But then in verse 5, there's a turning point. Finally, I confessed my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Think about that. Think about a God who doesn't shame you or push you away, but wipes away the guilt of all the wrongs you've ever done. Good news. Amen. But David then concludes in the very next verse, of, and looking back on this experience, he says to all of us, therefore let everyone who is godly, who wants God in their life, offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found, and surely in the flood of great waters they shall not reach him. Again, how many of us have experienced overwhelm at our own garbage, unable to manage, unable to get control, feeling hopeless and helpless? As I said, we're going to talk at the end about how do we respond. But the third and the last category is what I would call societal ungodliness. Now, I'll just confess, I workshopped this this week, and I couldn't think of the best way to say this. I struggled with, you know, wickedness, sin, rebellion. It's basically the same thing. Rejection of God and his truth. Rejection of God and his truth. And it's not just our society. I say society. It's the world. It's a worldwide flood to which pretty much every writer in the New Testament speaks explicitly. Uh, two of the most descriptive, in my opinion, if you want to write them down, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 3. If you remember 2 and 3, all you have to remember is Timothy and Peter. 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 3, very direct, vivid language speaking to the last days in which we live and what people will be like. And Peter in his first letter is writing to these believers in five different provinces in what is modern day Turkey. And he compares this flood of wickedness to, uh, to this wickedness to a flood. Verse 3 of that chapter of 1 Peter 4, he says, You have had enough time in the past 
doing the evil things that godless people enjoy, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of wild and destructive living, or some translations say debauchery, there's different translations, and they slander you, or they malign you. Now, you may have noticed what we just read is not one flood. (laughs) It is multiple overlapping, intersecting waves rolling across culture and the world, but they all revolve around the same thing, rejecting God and his design for us as humans. Many examples of this, but one that Peter references in a few different ways, sexual activity beyond the boundaries God has established. Even just the things that we enjoy, TV shows that I say I enjoy, that I'm entertained by that, and it's filled with terrible stuff, but it has a great actor, and it got great reviews, right? And a lot of this comes down to what Peter calls, quote, sensuality. As, as, as people reject God as the basis for how we are to live life on this planet, the new standard is how I feel. My senses are the metric for what is right and wrong, even if God's empirical biological design says otherwise. If I feel this way, that is the ultimate truth. And you cannot tell me that is not what is happening in our culture today. But I was thinking, what if we applied this sensuality to every area of life, pushed it to its extreme? Like if I said, I feel like your stuff is my stuff. And can you tell me I'm wrong? Nah. Not without retribution, so I'll be over to get my stuff today. (laughs) I feel like marrying my dog. I know this is obtuse. I'm being purposely obtuse. But if love is love, there is no love like what I have with my dog. (laughs) Some of you are rolling your eyes. Some of you may be a little offended. The fact, though, is you cannot tell me I'm wrong without some standard of what's right and wrong. And what we have in God's word is not just a standard, but God's blueprint for how we're made to live and thrive on the planet. You see? This is not some restrictive Old Testament-y thing. This is how you're made to be the best version of you. And we have outright said, no, I don't believe you're telling me the truth. Instead, I believe what I'm feeling right now. As crazy as this sounds, I'm sharing all of this to kind of crack the ice a little on the craziness because we've been so terrified to say anything because we'll get in trouble. And I feel it, but you know what? I'm, we're in good company. Peter felt it. The early church felt it. He speaks to it here. The world, he says, the world is surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of wild and destructive living. They're surprised. And, and this Greek word, by the way, is asotia, um, the wild and destructive living, debauchery, whatever it says in your Bible, asotia, very interesting word. It's two Greek roots. Sotia, the second half, uh, means soundness of thinking, rationality, wholeness. It's actually where we get our word salvation. Do you know what the prefix a means? Without or not. Not sound in reasoning, not rational, not whole. A flood of this in the world. And so they're surprised when we don't join, but then if they were just surprised and went, ha oh, silly Christians and moved on, but Peter adds on, they malign you. Where good is evil, and evil is good. They slander you. It's not to each his own anymore. It's groupthink, it's bullying where you can't disagree. And in a nutshell, I would describe this as the normalization and celebration of things God says are evil, and then the demonization, and I would suggest eventually the criminalization of those who don't agree. And just to broaden the scope of this flood for us, church, some of you may have some terms in your mind, some categories, some groups, whether it's homosexuality or whatever it is, and and we love to pick a few things out and say, that's it. That's the problem. Those people. But did you know, friends, the New Testament spends 
far more time calling out people who are, quote, lovers of money. <laughs> quote, proud, ungrateful. So we can stand at a distance and judge, but if we're honest, every single one of us deals with the flood of personal sin. And every single one of us, apart from Christ, is an equal contributor to the wickedness of society. We all need Jesus. But if you've not felt this flood that I'm talking about where you're pushed into a corner and you feel bad for wanting to say, I think God has a better way. If you haven't felt that, I would suggest it's possible that you're moving with it. And for the record, floods carry things beyond their boundaries. That, that's the whole idea of a flood. It overflows its, its boundaries. And I can't even say that word. Speaking of, of, of um, things that are maligned and criticized, it's hard to even talk about boundaries today without sounding old-fashioned. But think about water, right? We would all agree water is a good thing to the extent that we would not be alive if it weren't for water moving through all these channels we call rivers? What happens though when that water overflows the boundaries? Destruction. Listen, the very thing God intended to bring life ends up destroying life. When what he's created within a boundary overflows that boundary. Friends, there are so many examples of this in our culture that God gave us to enjoy like sexuality but our culture has blown past boundaries and it's wreaking havoc in the world. But again, if you, if you try to maintain boundaries, you're seen as the enemy. And I just want to ask, what is our response to this? What is our response to this experience of, of this flood coming across? And, and I want to just share a few things from my own heart. We are not called as the church to take up arms against people. We are not called as the church to win the argument because think about this. Picture standing on the edge of a flooded river and you see a group of people caught out in the middle going down. How do you feel about them? Do you say, ah, those stupid people? Maybe. Uh, Hopefully not, right? Hopefully there's some compassion. There's some sense of that could have been me. And maybe you even do whatever you can to find a way to get to them. Church, are we finding ways to get to the world? Or are we just standing on the banks telling everyone how wrong they are? Even as I think about jumping in the water to go and try to help somebody, I'm like, that's crazy, I can't do that. But that's the mystery of, as Jesus prayed for us in the book of John, being in the world, but not of the world. There's some sense in which we feel the flood, we're in it, but our feet are planted in Christ. And so we're not carried downstream, we're actually able to grab onto people and say, come with me, it's better. And this is where I want to take kind of the rest of our time to talk about our response and the remembrance that God is mightier than the flood. Because right after David has this panicky moment, the floods have risen, the floods, the floods he introduces some really good news. Verse four, he comes back to the original confidence of verse one and says, mightier than the thundering of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. How many times did he say that? One time for every one of those floods that we face, God is mightier, he's mightier, he's mightier. God is mightier. Can you actually say this with me? God is mightier. Say it again. God is mightier. Amen. Now, I want you to pull it back to a personal level right now. And just right now in your own awareness, think of a flood you've been dealing with. Maybe it was personal sin or a relational conflict, just the the weight of something going on in the world. Let yourself feel that for a second. Now, could we in this moment, as the church of Christ, the church of God, respond in faith by looking at that flood and saying, God is mightier. Can you say that? God is mightier. Say it one more time. God is mightier. Amen. 
Now, on top of that, I don't know if you've noticed, but just saying God is mightier doesn't always fix the problem. (laughs) It's a step. It's faith. Exercise your faith. But when we're down here in the flood, hearing that God is seated on his throne isn't always an encouraging thought. Thanks, God. Good for you, (laughs) right? How does God sitting on his throne affect my experience in the flood? That's what I want to address. And we have to start by believing God wants to give us everything we need. He intends to. He's delighted to. Not just to get by in the flood, but to thrive in this life. And so Psalm 29.10 portrays God's reign, but in relation to our flood. Beautiful verse. Psalm 29.10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Notice something, that God is not pacing around the, uh, the throne room, wringing his hands, wondering if it's all going to work out. He's in his throne. He's seated. God is 100% in control and not worried. But again, how does that affect me? <laughs> the very next verse is the answer. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. You know, as I was reflecting on that day out in the middle of the river, and I had to boil it down, the two things I I needed more than anything else, strength and peace. As the water was pounding down on me, I realized, gosh, I don't know if I can stand in this, practically. But then I had this equally vivid inner reality that mirrored the flood around me. I was terrified. I had forgotten that God was enthroned, that he was in charge. I needed peace. I needed to know, hey, I have a God who's on his throne. Nothing that can happen in this life can separate me from his love, can take away the life that he's given me in Christ. Strength and peace. God says, I will give you those things, but, but the way to get those things. See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dig deeper and deeper and get practical. How do we get his strength and his peace? Look at the last verse of the psalm, if you're open to Psalm 93 still. The last verse of the psalm, David says, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Notice how after describing the floods, which is this feeling of your feet swept out from under you, there's literally nothing trustworthy in that experience. David contrasts it with your word is trustworthy. God's decrees, his word, his testimonies, it's called a bunch of different things in the Bible. It's not going anywhere. It's not changing with seasons or with culture. And then he adds holiness is literally fitting for the people who live in your presence. So listen to this. A life of stability amidst the floods is built around God's word and God's way. His decrees and the holiness, which is actively living out the otherness of your faith. Being okay, being a little weird maybe in in the eyes of our culture. When they look at you and they're surprised you're not participating. That's good. That's a good sign. That's holiness. A life of stability is built around God's word and God's way, which I would say are the two things culture has outright rejected. I don't want to hear what God has to say, and I'm absolutely not going to do what God says to do. But this is how we access his strength and his peace, is bringing ourselves under his authority, saying, God, I don't know the right way forward, but I know you do. Lead me. Because again, these boundaries God provides are not restrictive. They're here to help us enjoy the things that he's made us to enjoy. I couldn't help but think of one more example of boundaries, and it's fire. (laughs) How many would say fire is a good thing? Absolutely, I'm so thankful for fire, and yet we have a front row seat to how destructive fire can be. What's the difference, though? Boundaries. Fire within boundaries is helpful. Fire outside of boundaries is destructive. Which is why God's decrees are trustworthy. We don't have to wonder whether or not God is holding out on us. And right on the other side of that boundary is where I'm really going to get to some good stuff. It's a lie. 
God has built these boundaries so we can live fully and freely and not kill ourselves. But when we look at these three floods, relational conflict, personal sin, ungodliness in the world, each of these biblical references that I've mentioned this morning also have practical help for how to respond in the midst of the flood. And we're gonna wrap up very quickly. I just wanna mention a few of these examples because this is an example of God's decrees. David says, your decrees are trustworthy. What are some of those things? Psalm 144, David is writing about relational conflict. He says, rescue me, God, from, um, and deliver me from many waters. The next verse, he defines it as those who speak lies about me. Relational conflict, right? But then in the very next verse, almost out of nowhere, he says, I will sing a new song to you, O God. What? <laughs> Upon a ten-stringed harp, I will play to you who gives victory to kings and who rescues David, his servant. Man, that, that is such an abrupt shift in thinking. Uh, it, this flooded by feelings of frustration about people who are lying about me. And then I will sing a new song to the Lord. What? And I was asking myself, honestly, would that be my next verse? If this was a psalm of Micah, man, how much of the time is it retaliation? Is it finding someone to complain to? Is it avoidance? Is it escaping into something to numb the pain? But David intentionally presses into God. I will, I, I will sing a new song. And so the, the takeaway, a couple for me, is worship in the water. Hope that's not cringy. Is that cringy? Tell me later. <laughs> My point is we so often associate worship with good times, right? And, and bad times are for complaining and grumbling. But worship songs is for Sunday morning when I have my coffee. And, and, and what you see, though, when you read the Psalms is David brings worship into the middle of the flood, over and over. And that doesn't mean I don't think that David is experiencing the rejection from his family and friends. And then he goes, oh, thou great Lord on high and pray. You know, like, I think he's, I think his worship is pretty darn raw. Just like we read last week in Psalm 62, pour out your hearts to God. There's no filter there. You tip it over and it all comes out. Because God already sees it. He's not surprised by that. But that's that new song. You're saying, God, I don't have any place to go but sing to you, and this is driving me crazy. And I know you're good, but I have no idea what's going on, and I don't know how to fix it. Hey, I should write some music to that. <laughs> sing a new song to the Lord. Worship in the water. What if you found one moment this week where you know, okay, this is a flood. I feel it every week. It's a theme for me. What if you just had one moment, one sentence where you Press toward God in the middle of that. The second observation from these Psalms where David is describing the flood is start with God. Start your day with God. This sounds so practical, but David addresses it. Psalm 88, people are attacking him. He says, they surround me like a flood all day long. They have engulfed me completely. That sounds pretty hopeless. But again, right in the middle of that, David says, but I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Notice David's intentionality. He knows the day will be filled with floods. Amen? The day will be filled with floods. Many of them, we had no idea were coming for us. And if we're, if we're only dealing with one wave at a time, that would be nice. Oh, look, hearken. Relational conflict coming my way. <laughs> How much of the time, though, is relational conflict a product of my personal sin? overlapping waves. And then I live in a culture that says, well, if it's not working with your spouse, quit. Get out of that. Overlapping waves, it's overwhelming coming at us. But David says, before you check your messages, before you read the headlines, just even have a moment with God. Because that's where your strength and your peace are going to come from, his word and his way. And so with every one of these floods described in scriptures, I, I understand there's a lot of nuance to just say, here's the answer. 
Relational conflict, oh man. I'm so thankful we have experienced professional people who understand how to navigate that and help us. How to understand what's going on in our culture and, and respond to it as a matter for great wisdom and, and boldness and filled with the love of Christ. But for all the nuance, I studied and I just I see one consistent theme between all of it. Move toward God. Talk to God. Build your life around him. Make room for him in the practical moments of your day. Because even with David's personal sin, Psalm 32, everything changed when he said, I confessed my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. And what happened? He forgave. God forgave. He's so free in what he gives to us. So we can confess our sins to each other. James 5 says that brings practical healing. I love that verse. But only God can wipe away the guilt of your sin. Only God can lift the burdens you're not meant to carry. Move toward him. And that's what we're going to talk about next week as we close. That there is a counter flood. I'm really excited for this. Uh, where God's people are not just trying to avoid getting swept downstream. But God's people are actively, uh, the Bible calls it a flood of righteousness, a flood of justice. It's a counter flood where we're not just telling the world how wrong they are, but we're showing the world how right God is in the way we live our lives. So people see us and say, that's better. Not those cynical, religious, judgmental people. Because the reality is wickedness will not remain. We're going to talk about how there's a flood of judgment. And the Bible even uses the language, I think in Leviticus, of the the, the land vomiting out the inhabitants who have lived wickedly on it. There is a flood coming. But in the meantime, righteousness is the only thing that has roots. Righteousness is the only thing that's going to last. And to be clear, that doesn't mean perfection. It means right relationship with God. So next week, Psalm 85, we're going to look at that psalm and and unpack what is this counter flood that we're called to live out as God's people. But I want to make space as we respond, um, if our worship team could come to the front. I want us to, as God leads, receive a little bit of practical help with the floods we're facing. And and I love what Donnie said earlier, all the stuff he says I love. Um, Where are you, Donnie? You're welcome. Um, no, I just, I love his shepherding heart and the way he pushes on things with us. But, but just the idea that, man, r- this is a tiny little window in the week. This is not it. There's a lot that's going to happen, but we want more than anything. And this is a conversation we've had as a board, as a staff, to not just teach and tell, but to like train and, 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 and help us have a taste of something better that we could leave here saying, whoa, that was different. But you know what? In order to have that, we're going to be stretched a little bit. And this is what growth feels like. So what I want to offer in in, in our time, normally we'd say, come down front for prayer, which I think subliminally sends the message that we are the ones with some special access to God. That's not biblical. It's not true. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 says Christ has given gifts to his entire body for the building up of one another. Amen? And so we are here. I do play a role. It's not insignificant, but I'm just a little piece of the body. I have one little role. You all have very different roles that all are needed to build up the body. And so rather than saying, come down and pray, I would love to just activate the gifts in the body right now to say, yes, let's use our gifts. And, And specifically, two things. If you're feeling flooded today, in any of those areas or any that I maybe didn't mention. The band is going to play, and I would just encourage you to take a step of faith in a moment and just do this. Just, just put a hand up. And those of you who are around someone who puts their hand up, if you see someone, I want to encourage you to pray for that person. Go and pray for that person. If the person's across the room and you feel God prompting you to get up, get up. Go and pray for that person. And practically, that can be a a general prayer, God, whatever flood this person is facing. I pray they'd experience your strength and your peace. Pray as the Holy Spirit leads you. He's better than me, right, at at this. Um, 
You could ask them if there's anything they want to share with you. If they say no, just go ahead and pray. And again, I realize this is a stretch for many of us. Um, but the only way to move forward is to take a step. That is our heart as leaders. And so for the next few minutes, um, just kind of go like this a little, move a little bit, shake out this structured environment where we're all facing one person uh, on stage with some things to give you. Let's just kind of breathe a little bit, look around the room, close your eyes if you want, settle in. And as this music plays, I want you to just tune in right now and even say, God, speak to me. Holy Spirit, lead me. Lord, have your way in our time. God, for, for those, I, I, every one of us, I think, could put our hands up right now. There's so much coming at us, God, and we are not meant to carry or to deal with this by ourselves. So I pray you'd lead us in this room to put up our hands. I pray you'd lead us to respond and to move toward each other and to pray. In Jesus' name.